Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Biney, and I'm a 2012 graduate of Penn State um, in public relations. I am also a member of the Belisario College of Communications Alumni Society Board. So I'm happy to be here this evening to moderate the discussion tonight about corporate communications. We have two of our alums here tonight that will be panelists, Patrick Bunting, who is the Senior Director of Communications at NBC Universal, and Bernadette Dunn, who is the Senior Director of Communications at Comscope. So Pat and Bernadette, thank you again so much for being here this evening. Bernadette, Absolutely. do you wanna kick it off and just talk a little bit about yourself, your role, and about what was your path from Penn State? Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us on this snowy night. Um, I am, uh, my name is Bernadette Dunn, uh, and I am a 1991 graduate from the College of Communications. Uh, my major was advertising with a women's studies minor. Um, and even though that was some time ago, I've had quite a, quite a path. Uh, I started out as um, advertising and marketing uh, coordinator uh, at a publishing company, then a travel company. Uh, and then I switched uh, over to corporate communications and employee communications and really focusing on uh, the corporate side and working within uh, technology companies. And that's where I've stayed. Uh, currently, I lead corporate public relations for Comscope. Uh, Comscope is a uh, video, broadband, and telecommunications technology company. So uh, with this COVID era that we're in, my company makes all of the products that bring internet to you, as well as your mobile self-service. So we make all the towers and things like that that Verizon, AT&T, and the likes use to get you know, signals to you. Um, so in addition to corporate PR, which includes financial communications, crisis communications, sustainability, and leadership communications, I also lead employee communications and social media for the company. So it uh, keeps me quite busy. We have a, a small team. Um, there are about eight of us in our corporate communications team. Um, so we wear many hats, but that's what keeps it exciting. So that's a bit about me. I'll hand it off to Patrick. Hey everybody, uh, this is thanks for having me join you guys tonight. Um, I'm a 2013 graduate of Belisario um, with a degree in telecommunications. I've spent my entire career for the most part with, with the exception of one year um, at NBCU. I started with the PAGE program um, right out of Belisario. I uh, had three rotations in that program and we could, if anyone's interested we can talk more about it later. But um, I worked in corporate communications um, at in PR at USA Network and then in talent relations at the Today Show. I then graduated from the program and went to the Today Show full time as a junior publicist for two years before going to corporate communications um, at NBC where I focused on at the advertising sales division and working on public relations for them. And that's led by um, an NBC, uh, sorry, a Belisario alumni named Lindy Acarino. I don't know if anyone has seen her. She's pretty famous around the school. Um, I left for a year to go to Facebook and work on internal and employee communications for their sales division. And then I came back to NBC about a year and a half ago to do corporate communications, focusing on <clears throat> our partnerships with all content providers around the country, whether that be Comcast, Charter, AT&T, DirecTV, Dish, YouTube, Hulu, um, and now more Roku. And I'm also working on the, di the distribution of our DTC service, Peacock. Thank you both so much. And I do want to note that the chat function is up and live and ready for your questions. So feel free to drop any questions in the chat and I will be sure to ask our panelists them. Um, I know you both kind of discussed that you do some internal, some employee communication, social media. So how would you define corporate communications? Um, so I think what's really interesting about corporate communications is, is uh, just about every company has some form of it. Um, some small, some large. Um, and corporate communications, as many of you probably know, can fall under marketing. It can fall you know, unto its own with the chief communications officer. So there, there are many different ways that it can appear in a company. Um, and again, it's usually relative to its size. Um, so what I think is so unique about it is that you're, you're really a partner to the leadership team. Uh, within the company, and you're a, a trusted advisor. Um, it, you, any day, I mean, look at last year with um, the COVID crisis, and we continue in it. Um, that was what I call a drop everything moment. And when uh, things started off in the beginning of the year, we have 
um, operations in China. And uh, the issue started in December and we could see how it was gonna start to ripple through the company. And that's where um, you are the liaison to the crisis teams, the operations teams, um, and really helping people in a time of crisis. I mean, literally um, helping them understand how to stay safe, but also what it, we as a company needed to do uh, in this time, in this crazy time, um, and keeping people focused. Uh, so it's you, you become an extension of the leadership team and um, that trust that you develop and those relationships that you develop really, um, I think, cement uh, the role uh, within a company. So very important. It's, uh, you know, from our investors, we're a public company, to our customers and partners who sell our products, um, to our employees. I mean, all of those audiences uh, we're communicating with and developing relationships relationships with. So especially last year, I can't, I know we'll probably hit on it a few times and you probably talked about it uh, so many times, but it really did shape uh, the importance of communication, corporate communications, you know, in, in our company and, and what, what kind of impact we could really make. Um, so I think going forward, it's really changed, you know, and again, solidified that relationship with the CEO to the board of directors, to our legal team and our crisis teams. So, um, that to me is, is a really interesting spot to be in and, and a really valuable place to be. Yeah, I would, I would tag on. I think that's what I really like about corporate communications is that seat at the table you get with executives yeah. and whatnot. I would say the differences and the nuances between kind of external, internal communications, you're mm -hmm. probably going to see more and more as you start to apply for jobs or internships, you're going to see these with a lot of the larger companies, what they call highly matrixed or, um, you know, fabricated companies where, I'll take my company, for example, all of our business units sit differently. Each one has its own head of communications mm -hmm. and their role is both external comms and internal comms. But then we also have a centralized team that sits here who might say tomorrow we want, you know, next week, the whole company is going to meet, you know, diversity and inclusion is a huge mm -hmm. thing universal in every company right now. And we meet once a month as a company to, you know, talk about a certain topic. Then we break out into groups with our teams, but you know, corporate might say to us, here's the invitation, here's the executive note, have your business leader, you know, please put this in your business leader's voice and make sure your whole team, should, you know, comes, accepts the invite for that meeting. So your job is really in these, when it's in your big company is to focus on your external constituents, who that may be. When I was in ad sales, it's our clients and, and the, the ad ages and the ad weeks in the Wall Street journals. Now it's <laughs> cable trades and cable clients, but taking a corporate message, putting it into the voice of your external constituents and your internal teams mm -hmm. that you work with, um, I would say is, is kind of the, how I define the corporate communication structure. Yeah. And, and if I could add to that, Patrick, um, you know, depending on the size of the company too, I mentioned wearing many hats. Um, I think what's really um, exciting about corporate communications and not to oversell it, but um, is that you are a journalist you are a consultant, sometimes you're a video producer, sometimes you're an event manager, um, sometimes you're a moderator of a panel, sometimes, you know, you just, you are called upon to be kind of that, that uh, central point that either leaders come to uh, in uh, functions such as human resources or IT, they come to you for your expertise. So you become this this kind of mini agency uh, within your company, um, and and um, and and you really get to do a lot of different things. Um, and again, like I said last year, with with the crisis and, and how that evolved, that took that superseded everything, and uh, and everything else kind of got put on the shelf. But really, you get to flex your muscles in so many different areas um, and work with so many different team members across the company. Talk a lot about you know having a seat at the table and really being able to provide um, your expertise to executive leadership. Have you ever, I guess, had any conflicts with that? Because you know you hear from different um, professionals in the industry where um, CEO or other executives may not value a public relations professional or a corporate communications mm -hmm. professional. So, what's your kind of advice to how to tackle that? Sure. Uh, oh, you're, yeah. Go ahead, Patrick. You go no, first. You go, no, you go, go first. Ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah. um, I think that um, part, a lot of it is building relationships. 
Um, and uh, I know for my company, um, change is the name of the game. Uh, we tend, the, the industry that we work in, in telecommunications and, and broadband um, is so ever changing. And uh, just last year, amidst the COVID crisis, we had a, uh, uh, our CEO step down and new, uh, new C CEO step in. Um, so that CEO um, met with me and, and my counterparts and asked for our consultation. This is a person who's coming into the company, uh, knows a bit about it, um, you know, accepted a challenging role and is really looking for us to be the voice of the employees. What are they thinking? Um, what are their concerns? Um, and we know a lot of that because we see survey results, we interact with them, we see what questions they're sending in. So we can be that, uh, that liaison uh, for them, um, but also help inform the leadership team on how they should, what tone they should be using, um, what to avoid, um, where they can add value and they can really sheep, um, not only the culture of the company, but help direct the employees to the strategy that we're trying to execute. So uh, for me, I've been in a, in a very lucky place because of the change that always went on around us. Um, so being that kind of stable, you know, guiding light, if you will, uh, to help direct and consult. Um, it's, you know, and, and in marketing, you know, we, I do report into the marketing team. Um, and that's where you can sometimes have that fine line. Well, that's marketing. That's, you know, a little too salesy. Um, but, you know, you can bring some of that marketing flavor into what you do um, in how you write in the tone and headline writing and you're bringing a lot of that marketing and advertising expertise to the table um, and making things interesting. Uh, we're all competing for mindshare and uh, everybody has a, a finite you know, period of time. So you've really got to grab people and get their attention and get your message across quickly. So I, I've not struggled with um, leadership not valuing communications, you know, again, especially after last year. Patrick, what are your thoughts? I, um, this is funny because I'm actually going through a bit of this now. So, <laughs> and I'm looking at Mike's name here and he, he knows very well a few of the executives I used to work for every day. And I would actually come to Penn State with when they would come do these types of things. Um, they, you know, worked in the advertising space where mm -hmm. part of their job was to give speeches all the time, travel nonstop, giving industry stages, doing keynotes, et cetera. And I would work um, with them on writing those speeches, on going to those events, on traveling with them, you know, two weeks out of the month, every month. And, you know, I really enjoyed that. I did the same thing then when I went to Facebook and that was part of why they wanted me to go there because they knew the people I was working for at NBC and they wanted me to do the same thing there. I came back to NBC for a job with for a team that was really busy the next two years doing deals equal in size to the ad business. And they don't talk about them. They don't talk about them in the press. They don't talk about them on industry stages. I'm there for when basically for when things go wrong. Yeah. Um, and that kind of wasn't what I um, and to work with the government affairs team again, in case something went wrong. And things like that kind of wasn't and at first I was like, okay, I'm learning, getting up to speed. And then these past few months, I kind of was like, I'm a little bored. Um, I would like to bring some of that to this. And I know it's going to be, it's going to make people a little uncomfortable. I, be, I started to kind of working with my manager who also is our CMO of our group. Um, so our marketing, she leads our marketing function. And funny enough for um, students on this call was my first intern manager um, nine years ago at NBC. Um, she, and I had this conversation with her and just, I was feeling frustrated. I was feeling undervalued and I wanted to start doing these things. And she and I kind of worked through a, how is this, how could we start getting people comfortable without ruffling feathers? And what would that look like? And taking some chances here and there, we started getting people more and more comfortable. Um, we we signed a few deals at the end of the year this year on New Year's Eve actually is how our business works, which is kind of <laughs> and ruins your holidays. And um, we did an announcement a, a couple days before or a couple days after New Year's Eve um, announcing a billion dollar deal. And it was like a light switch went off with, you know, the two executives who lead my group were, have, have been in this business 30 years. And now they're like interested. They want to be, you know, they were calling me nonstop asking what's going on with it. And, you know, I feel like we finally maybe turned a leaf and these, and now it's been what a month since then. And 
we had a great conversation today with the Wall Street Journal, even if it was just off the record, um, which for everyone here, if you're not totally familiar, means it can't be reported. Um, it's more for them just to kind of develop a relationship with the executive. It's, it's been night and day and, and it took time and it, it took, you know, some mentoring to my manager who'd been working with them forever, but um, I like couldn't sit back and not try to do that, so. Great. Um, just again, a reminder, um, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to drop it into the chat function of Zoom. Um, I know a lot of things have changed with COVID within the last year. So how has that really changed your day-to-day -day responsibilities? I know you kind of check, mentioned that how your roles have changed, you've taken on new responsibilities, uh, but how has that impacted corporate communications as a whole and how do you see it um, changing in the future? Yeah. Um, so it, it, like I said, you know, we, we started uh, hearing about the virus um, you know, at the end of 2019 and into 2020. And I think um, what it did is highlight, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, um, okay, all the fun stuff we had planned and all that cool stuff that we had uh, going for 2020, we're gonna put it aside because right now it's about keeping people safe, keeping the business going and surviving, you know, literally surviving. Um, it got to be, you know, I, I have, I was, I'm part of the crisis team and uh, we were on daily calls talking about our factories and our employees. Could they get to the factories? Could they uh, deliver the products that our customers like Patrick's company, Comcast need um, to support internet uh, as students are, are, are learning from home, as companies are sending everybody home to work at other houses? Well, you know, we were making the products that were helping customers like Comcast and Verizon boost their networks so that all of these functions could be supported. Um, so, you know, it was very much a 24 hour a day type of thing. Um, it got to the point where we started, um, you know, talking about deaths and, and people who were unfortunately our colleagues passing away. Um, and um, that is, that takes a very emotional toll and uh, when you hear, you know, what our company did was, you know, really speak to the names and, and, and talk about, you know, their tenure with the company and what they contributed. So the humanity of it really struck me is that, you know, you can go on your day and, and produce and churn out communications and get the job done. And then something like that halts you and says, wow, this is, this is, you know, these are people's lives. This is their livelihood and their families. So it really, um, it really grounds you in what's important. Um, but, you know, kind of looking ahead, I, I, I have been become a, more of an expert in the virus than I care to be and what vaccination schedules look like and um, protocols for visits to customer sites. Um, or, or our own sites. So I've been, you know, very focused on our, with our environment and health and safety teams. Um, but, but looking ahead, it's, to me, it has changed how we communicate. I mean, look at us now and look at all of you. You've been on Zoom for I don't know how many months now. Um, it, it has changed how we attend customer events and trade shows. We used to ship a bunch of pe 50 people off to, a, you know, Las Vegas for a a trade show and show all of our products. And now it's just what you see here. We're, we're demonstrating product, products virtually. Um, our, our sales teams are engaging with customers virtually and trying to strike up, you know, find creative ways of building relationships. Um, for communications, we've had to, uh, you know, change our town hall formats, um, you know, just really adapt to that virtual way of being. Um, but what I think some of the outcome has been is that it's brought people closer, um, if that's possible. Um, all of us were working in offices and things and the po people who were remote and the, that few, the few people who did work remotely now feel on a level playing field. It feels more inclusive to everybody because we're all in the same boat. Uh, we're all trying to, to make it work uh, from our homes, our home offices, um, our kitchens. Um, so I think it's really changed how people interact. Um, and, and Patrick, I don't know if you'd agree, but even turning on a camera um, on a call uh, before COVID, you'd have two or three people on a large meeting that may have shown their camera. Now it is 
the way we do it. Um, it's just, and you get to see into people's homes and you learn about them and you see their dogs and their cats and their, their kids running in the background. And it, it's, it's just, to me, brought the humanity back into uh, communications. Um, and I know that was a bit long-winded, maybe a little sappy, but I, I truly believe that it's changed how we're gonna do things going forward. Yeah, I would completely agree. I, I think it it's, I'm, I'm, I just would consider myself not a warm person. Um, and I think that the, this has really changed me and how I think about internal comms and caring much more about like what everyone is thinking and what everyone and how everyone is feeling. Um, you know, I think I talked about NBC being a big place and where each division kind of does their own thing. There's each its own head of comms. We talk, we already talked twice a week and it was always just everyone showing off what they're working on. Mm -hmm. And now it's become still some of that, but it's also some of, here's how we're talking about this, whether it be yeah. COVID and response to working from home or COVID and the response to the teams that still go into the office for news and production, et cetera. And it's kind of like, oh, you're saying that? Well, then I need to say this or, you know, my, or, oh, you guys are saying that? Yeah, well, you have to, but we're not going to say that yet. It's kind of, there's mm -hmm. a lot of that. I think the frequency of communication is stronger than ever before. I think yeah. we're, the team I work for now, the group I work for now is a small team. It's only a hundred people. Whereas at other times of the company, I've worked in groups that are thousands of people when it was sales or news. And this, this team expects a lot of touch bases from executives when they were in the office. And so I started to work with our executives on having way more all hands, having way more emails yeah. that have gone out to the team than ever before. Um, from the external standpoint, I'm doing a lot more talking about the social good of what our company's been able to do. We made our news program completely free for all Americans um, at the start of COVID and, and did that for um, a sizable amount of months. And we're still doing some of that in many ways. And so we, you know, we like to make sure reporters know about that. We're not looking for a story of any sort, but it's just good to highlight. Um, and Comcast pulls that all together about, you know, all the things that the company has done um, in that. And then lastly, um, I also handle all talent relations for our partnerships. And um, we've started to have like housewives, Zoom happy hours um, with different clients and with partners and um, we've had Olympians call into our client meetings that are virtual just to kind of give pep talks and stuff like that. Uh, and that's been fun to work on because, again, you see a different side of the talent that's different when they're all dolled up and, and in a ballroom in Vegas or something. Mm -hmm. You're talking to a housewife while she's sitting in her living room, you know, getting ready to talk to people without glam. So it's been fun. And I think, too, um you know, I know all of you and I know Penn State is, has been focused on mental health. Um, uh, that has been um, a real focus as well. Again, not something that I've ever communicated about. I haven't had to. Um, sure, there's stress and there's all of that, but um, our company and, and probably, you know, NBC Universal as well, really took a st step back um, to provide resources to just help employees understand. I mean, I know students as well is just understand that it's like, again, they say it's okay not to be okay. Um, and that this is highly unusual and um, your, your life, your personal life and your professional life are clashing and what goes into being on a screen for nine hours a day and the toll that that takes and, and providing those resources, providing downtime, um, giving tips for leading a team in this crazy world, um, having people take a break, um, you know, reminding people to take vacation, even if you can't go anywhere, um, you know, just, you know, binge Netflix or, or do something and rearrange re the closet, just take the break because it is so important. And, and I, again, I never thought we'd be talking about things like this in a corporate 30,000 person company, um, but we are. And, um, and I don't think that will stop either. I think that's something that will be just much more, um, will be much more attuned to. Yeah, I would agree. I think our our chief operating officer sent out a note about like you have to like you have to take some vacation time yeah. um, and turn and tune off. And the other thing is we've really taken a stance on it, it, NBC Universal and Comcast feel it's really unacceptable for someone to have to to leave the workforce because they can't you know they don't have the sort support and resources they need to take care of their family. Um, and and the companies are doing whatever they can to make sure that doesn't happen and that they're losing yeah. people because they need to take, you know, they don't have childcare or they don't have health. Right. 
right. uh, for their family members. I have a question here from um, Leah to Bernadette. Um, so you mentioned that you oversee the social media for corporate communications and that you help guide the voices of the leadership team. How are you helping the top executives understand the importance of social media? Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of unique in our company. Um, first, we're starting with the basics. Um, some of our executives don't have a social media presence. Um, or they have a very minimal social media presence. Um, so my team uh, is helping them build that. We're, we've even gone as far as going into their profiles and helping them build it out. Um, so that, that's about as basic as it gets. Um, but we are sharing, we're, we're sharing examples of, um, and I think where you see the, the, the uh, great examples of social media expertise is with our sales teams. Um, they're the ones who are using social media to drive uh, customers to read a white paper or to learn more about a new product or to join them for a, an online webinar about a new solution. So I, I think our sales teams have been the experts at doing that. We then kind of take that learning and bring it to our leadership team to say, look, you're, you know, you're the representatives of the company. Anybody who wants to come and work for us is going to look up the CEO, is going to look up the chief marketing officer or the chief commercial officer. So you need to be that, that, uh, that um, example uh, in social media for them. So I do think that, um, as so it, and I'm looking at the corporate brand platforms, um, we are right now uh, undertaking a social media audit and taking a step back. Um, again, not that that was COVID related, but we did, um, we did join two companies uh, in 2019. We had a, an acquisition, a major acquisition of which I was a part. And um, we didn't, with the COVID crisis, we had to kind of put all of that integration work aside. We're now um, on, embarking on a social media audit to take a look at all of our channels, how we communicate our tone, how we're leveraging our executives and our employees to amplify what we're doing in social media. Are we on the right channels? Should we be doing TikToks? I don't know, who knows? So um, we're, we're, we're really exploring and rebuilding um, and bringing our executives along because, um, and you all learn this, that it's about the data. Um, if we can show that data, we can show that social media is driving visits to the website, is driving leads that, that enter the sales funnel. Um, that's where the value is. That's what they wanna see is that impact. So, um, you know, all of that audit work that we're doing is, is, is to show the impact of what we're doing so that it's not looked at as something, you know, uh, trivial or fluff or anything like that, that it's really strategic and driving eyeballs to where we want them to go. I actually, I'll tack on, I also lead social, I lead social marketing for our group. So that's doing um, consumer marketing on behalf of the brands when we're talking about distribution campaigns. And that my team, I have them sit with our agency um, who plans our media and really go through best practices before they write copy for. So if we're planning for a marketing campaign, they're gonna write upwards of a hundred tweets for different targets around the country. And then they're also gonna write all the talent. So we give all the NBC talent. If a, if a distributor is gonna say we're taking NBC off the air, we're gonna give upwards of 150 talent a tweet to say, mm -hmm. hey, X provider is, going to take away your NBC, don't let them do it. And my teams, I have them sit with it and, and just really ingrain themselves in what the best practices are. From an executive perspective, um, we limit them, not limit, but we guide them towards LinkedIn and Twitter um, mm -hmm. because I ultimately think that their business presence in my, in our world, at least, I find that those are the two places where they're going to push the needle forward from a monetary perspective. There's gonna be a, a client or someone there who sees that message and is gonna to wanna to invest. Right. Um, however, that said, you know, I normally try to coach them or, or guide them towards picking one to two, if they, if they want to make it personal as well, really think about what are the passions that they believe in. So um, my, NBC, my ad sales execs, um, again, either went, were alumni or have children who are in the Belisario College now, Penn State was a huge thing for them. So if on approaching, that was something they were always going to post about. Um, otherwise, it was a biz the articles that they were a part of, and it could be one other message. They were really into um, women's business, women in business organizations. We talked about that. 
Um, my executive now rescues dogs um, from Europe and has them come to America to find families. And so that's kind of his thing. And that's like, we're a business and we are rescuing dogs. And those are the two things we're going to focus on with your social media. Um, I just think it helps, you know, it just, it helps kind of keep things streamlined and keeps it easier for us um, and, and just keeps things kind of clean. Then Leah also added, um, you discussed mental health being an issue, especially now during COVID. So how does your corporate communications team partner with HR um, for things like employer branding and messaging around other important topics? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, I talked about that agency kind of mentality. Um, human resource, other than the executive team and the leadership team, human resources is, is probably our, our second top client, if you will. Um, I, uh, in my role, I'm, I'm considered part of the HR team, even though I'm not, um, because I am so integrated with uh, the leaders of the human resources team. Um, so we meet regularly, uh, probably two to three times a week. Um, and uh, I do have a, a key liaison that I work with in HR, but I also work directly with the, the head of human resources. She'll call me with an issue or a challenge or a heads up uh, about something that might be coming. So we have a really strong relationship, which is very, very important uh, to build that trust. Um, but employer branding, um, you know, we, we work very closely to guide them um, and partner with our marketing team. Um, so uh, in partnership with, with corporate communications, HR and our creative services team, um, we have developed an employment uh, branding uh, uh, some guidelines and um, a campaign, if you will, around that. Um, and, and the mental health, we, ha we have a, a, um, a PhD on staff who actually is, sits in the marketing, um, I'm sorry, the HR team. And it's her role uh, around employee experience to uh, pull together those resources, to point employees to them, to do that research. And uh, she records videos. We help support her um, in getting that communication out. We just sent her newsletter today. Uh, she's been doing a, a twice weekly, um, I'm sorry, twice monthly newsletter um, that points to TED Talks and articles and webinars, a lot of third party information, but it aggregate, she aggregates it all so the employees have it right at their fingertips and they can pop in and take time out of their day uh, to spend that time. So, you know, again, I think it's, it's a really, really strong partnership and keeping the communication lines open um, with them and, and they'll listen to us, you know, and, and we learn from them as well. Uh, so it's been working really well for us. And again, I think it's really solidified that relationship in the past year and a half. Uh, Patrick, how, how about you? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, communications and HR, I, I have seen every step of the way are lean on each other so much. I think because an HR team, it's not first nature to them to think of how to message something. It's, they kind of, you know, they, they have, they know every resource available to employees and they need help, your help in telling that story or telling, you know, yeah. how, what's the most succinct way to make sure people realize it. I'm actually in a weird place right now. We're both, um, my HR people are on maternity leave. So I'm kind of our <laughs> HR team as well right now. Um, <laughs> we have one person who's helping with like the, nitty gritty, but from a messaging and kind of like a figuring out what people need perspective, that's on my team at the moment. And, and a couple of things that I've said is like to um, the team that works for me is like start having coffees with people and figuring out just like, what do people need? What do people want to hear? Again, I'm pretty new to this group. So I don't always, it doesn't always register with me. Like, oh, that's something people, you know, don't automatically assume. I've also been at NBC a long time. So I just think like, Mm -hmm. Obviously, I know where to find that, but other people don't. And, and I, I take that for granted sometimes. Um, again, also being such a big company where things aren't everywhere, our cable networks have this amazing culture newsletter that tells you where to find fun things to do. We didn't have that and we it was too difficult to take theirs and fix it for us. So we just created our own it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but we do a monthly newsletter where it honestly, our interns, it's been something really fun for them to work on. Um, but it brings everything together, exercise classes, the HR resources you want, but also things like here's, you know, four people, here's what they're reading this month. Here's four recipes that these people did this month. And 
every month we change who's working on it. And we found that it, it, it's bringing people to, I had someone who I've never met in the year and a half I've been reach out to me being like, I loved that recipe. And she called me to talk about it. And we talked for five minutes and I would have never met this person. It just like made my day. And, you know, so it's, it's, we're finding these, I think to Bernadette's point, we're finding fun outlets to bring people together. And like, again, the, our comms team brought the relationships and brought the, what are people looking for? And HR really helped us like with the software to build something with the, here's where the resources are that we need. Um, but it's constant. I mean, we even a few, we had a group, a, a subset of us, probably a quarter of the team go into um, the office for the holidays. Uh, again, going back to those deals at the end of the year. And mm-hmm. there was, you know, some points there that really needed to be hit home about how to get tested, when to get tested, you know, what were the safety protocols you needed to do before doing so. Um, and I was one of the people who had to do this. So HR sent me everything and I was like, I wouldn't read this. I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we sat for almost a full day figuring out like, how are, how are, how are we going to get this so that people literally aren't confused on how, and it's, it's, it was complicated. And so it's a great partnership and it's, it's allowed me to do things I would never yeah. um, get to do otherwise. Yeah. I, I uh, also use them as a sound, a great sounding board. Um, they have the pulse of the company. They are out there talking with managers and employees, um, uh, you know, understanding their struggles, understanding where we need to hire, understanding, you know, where the business is going two years out and we have to build an engineering team in, in India or something to that effect. So, you know, I, I do rely on them as well as, you know, how will this message go over? Uh, do you think if our CEO says it this way um, or, or that kind of thing, they, they've been invaluable. And again, it's that two-way street. And, uh, and you know, that relationship is, is so strong and, um, and you can really learn a lot and you know a lot of a lot of the HR team are psychology majors, so they really can get into the into the mindset um, and, and understand how you can really make change happen and then get people on board with where I need them need them to go. We have another question from Colleen. Um, she asked, "What skills do you find to be the most critical in your roles as communicators?" Mm. So uh, so many of them. Um, I think um, obviously being a very strong writer. Um, if you're not a strong writer, then knowing what good writing is and how to get it out of your people or out of your agency um, or, or you know whomever you may be working with. Um, number one, uh, I think also um, having um, the ability to consult and to really think on your feet. Um, you know, again, going back to the crisis of the last year, um, nobody had that playbook in hand. Um, so how do you how do you figure out what's going to work from a communications perspective when some of the stuff has just never been done? We've never had to do things like this. Um, so what do you recommend? Uh, that's a constant question that came to me last year. What do you think we should do? What do you recommend? So having that ability to think on your feet, having a calm demeanor. Um, No matter what, Um, if you are hosting a town hall or in the middle of a crisis or it's 10 o'clock at night and you're getting a phone call, uh, just just having that that uh, that calm demeanor so that people around you um, feel that feel that um, confidence and feel that energy and say, okay, I, I trust this is the right way to go. Project management is key. Um, You need to know where all the balls are in the air and when when they're coming down and going back up and and help guide that and make sure that you're hitting deadlines when you need to. If you're dealing with the media and they're on deadline, you need to make sure that you're you're channeling things through. You need to make sure that you're getting all the approvals you need. Um, So I'm trying to think (laughs) all the other skills you need Um, and where you don't, where, know where you don't have them. Um, I know I'm not a graphic designer. I don't try to be one. I know who to call on. I know that I should just stick to the words. I should just, you know, bring in the, those trusted experts that I work closely with to get the job done. Um, so for me, those are, those are the top that I can think of now. Patrick, I'm sure you can think of plenty others. 
No, I think I think those were all you know so important. I think the writing thing is a huge deal, yeah. um, and you'll have opportunities throughout your career to really get better at it. And it's, I mean, you know, when you're when you're working and you're never going to be doing it alone. I think that's the one thing like that should never be a deterrent. I think yeah. what's nice is like when I've had to work on some really big speeches over the years, some I've done on my own, but other times like we've brought in, or you've, I've gotten to meet some amazing writers who've taught me so many amazing things. Um, Mike knows someone I worked with, um, Linda, who had, who we brought in writers once in a while for who, um, you know, work at like democratic conventions and have worked for Bill Gates and Bill Clinton. And um, it's been really cool to kind of see that at different times. I think another thing is to be a student um, of the work. I think you're not always going to understand everything you might be tasked with communicating, um, particularly in fields that are super complicated. They just, we, you know, we learn so much with our degrees in communications and in media, but, um, you know, there's, there's technology that, that, you know, people in engineering are even confused by and it, and it, 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 it knows. And that kind of leads me to my last point of relationships and like I knew I've known over the years, like who I could go talk to that would really sit down with me and explain something to me. And, mm -hmm. and to that end too, I think, you know, in working such for such a big company, like RPR people, like the biggest thing, like the biggest insult you can say to like one of my PR colleagues is like, how did you not call me a day or two ahead of time to tell me you were doing that? And like, what is that? Like the relationships are so important. Um, and, and, and even with, you know, as people leave and go other places. I mean, I last night was like frustrated about something at work and my one of my best friends that I worked with years ago works at Snapchat and she had, was having a similar problem and we just called to talk about it. And I felt so much better after. And so I think those are like the writing, being a student and then the relationships are huge, but obviously everything brings that and tacking onto that. Well, I, and I'll, I'll tag on, right, something you said is, is around the technology. Now, Patrick works, you know, there's technology in your company and mine as well. Um, and I will tell you, I don't understand a lot of it. Um, but I, I think what you have to trust is that, you know, as your, your role is to not assume that everybody else gets it either. Um, you know, it, it, there's sometimes a piece of technology or a technology trend like 5G um, that that is all the rage uh, and coming, you know, to a uh, to cell phone near you. Um, it, it, don't assume that the finance teams and the the the, the sales teams really understand um, why there's significance to certain technologies or how products work. So sometimes it's it's being able to ask the questions and say, look, I don't. How am I going to communicate this, and how am I going to make it relevant to people? Because if it's going over the, if it's going over your head, it's okay to say that and just question, um, put on a reporter's hat, um, and feel comfortable about questioning, um, because you'll get to a nugget that will just it'll snap it'll it'll click, it'll help you make it click for other people. So always ask the questions and always look at the what ifs. Well, what if this happened? Um, I tend to go to the opposite end of the spectrum of like, what's the worst case scenario here? How could an employee, if they misinterpret something or um, if there's a crisis and the media get hold of this information or if this is not how we want it to come out, what is the worst case scenario and how do you plan for that? I mean, that's Patrick, I, I don't know about you, but that's what I do on the daily. And you've got to really be ready. You may never have to use those talking points or those Q and A's that you put together, but the, 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 again, going back to the trust that your leaders have in you, the fact that you're ready for anything um, because you've thought and you've questioned and you've probed um, is, is really a value add. And again, you'll put that information on a shelf and you may have to use it next time or some other time, but at least you've been, you've really thought through every possible um, angle. I also want to add on kind of another skill set that I didn't really know when I graduated college going into my first um, position, um, the analytics side. And I know, Bernadette, you touched on that a little bit, but 
it is such a huge component of what we do, whether it's tracking social media or our integrated communications campaigns, really trying to see, are we moving the needle and how successfully are we doing that? So I think as, you know, communicators or, you know, students going into the communications field, I know I was one of them. I was like, oh, I'm not going to have to do math or statistics or any of that. And that's funny, after working for so long, I began to love the analytic side of it because you would get so excited when you actually saw that you were moving the needle or it was successful. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's just another thing I wanted to add on. Exactly. And then you can make decisions. All right. I mean, you, if you, if you aren't making that impact and the data isn't showing an impact, you change course. And that's, that's, that's why you have those reports and you should be tracking those monthly and, uh, and course correcting if you need to. Uh, But again, it goes back to, again, show me the data Um, in an engineering company like I work in. um, uh, These are engineering uh, leaders and they want to know, uh, okay, well, what was the re- ROI? What, what, what was the return and how are we going to get more out of it? Uh, so it is, it is so critical. Absolutely. Um, again, we're about 10 minutes away from ending this discussion. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free to drop it into the chat function. Um, I just wanted to ask another questions. I know students are probably, they're always dying to know what internships are available. And especially now during COVID, I know some will be virtual. So how can students prepare or get out there and get experience um, being remote? Yeah, Um, I know we talked about that uh, last week is that, um, you know, if in my company, unfortunately, um, you know, we're focusing more on engineering internships and, um, we've, we've had to, I, I didn't get approved for my internship, this, uh, my internship role this, uh, this summer, but, um, to students who are looking for internships, um, I would encourage you to be creative and think a bit outside the box on, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, could you, uh, look at a company in New York that you never would have looked at before, um, because they're offering a remote internship. Um, if you, don't land an internship, um, which can happen. Um, How do you turn your part-time job or your summer job into something? Can you do social media for the restaurant or the donut shop or, you know, um, or the small business or where's the nonprofit that needs an extra set of hands? Um, Are there ways that you can use your skills and, and bring them to the table? probably for free. Um, but, you know, there, there are ways that you can build your real work experience um, that, uh, that you've just got to really think creatively and reach out to your network, um, reach out to, you know, the passions that you have, whether it's dog rescue or, you know, you can be, you know, running a social media handle for, for some of these. They, they would welcome the opportunity. But um, so I, I'd really encourage you to, to think outside the box Um, but also to be ready with your work, Um, show your craft, show where, you know, whether it's, even if it's schoolwork, uh, projects that you're proud of that you did well with, um, or if you work for your sorority or a club, really be able to demonstrate, look, I, you know, I, I have experience here. I, you know, how to manage a project. I know how to track results, um, those types of things. So really be ready to show that. Yeah, I think, I think you hit pretty much everything on the head there. We, you know, our, my one other thing I would say, and this is, I've seen this with our interns a bit, um, we still do have a couple, is don't be afraid to do the same internship or to reach out to that boss you had and you had a good relationship the summer before. I think this is going to be, I know most people said, like, I don't want to say, I don't want to go back to doing that. I did it already. I want new and different. Our interns pretty much, I think, stayed um, for a second semester, at least two of them did and did slightly different stuff, but we just were like, they're in the groove. We know them. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, we are comfortable with them. We'll bring them back. And so if, if, if you did do something last summer, don't be afraid to reach back out and try to do it again. I don't think anyone's going to look differently on that because it, obviously we understand the circumstances. Yeah. I also have a question from Caitlin. She asked, is it unattractive to employers for recent college grads to not have an internship experience, but have other experiences? Um, I, have, I, I, would, I would 
not to say unattractive, but um, you know, I, I use an example of a conversation I had a couple of years ago with a, a, a Belisaria student um, who was concerned that she didn't have an internship, but she was going to be a nanny in Spain, um, you know, overseas and 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 work with a family, and you know, was concerned that she wasn't doing an internship. Um, so my my uh, my counsel back to that was, well, turn it into one. You know, can you write a blog? Can you you know do a, a video blog? Can you talk about that experience and what it's like for an American to be in Spain or learning the language or managing children or or how can you make that into an opportunity to write? How can you make that into an opportunity to shoot some video, do some editing, um, all of those things? How can you turn some of these experiences that you have into something that's showable and demonstrates, you know, your skills, which is, we all know is so important. Um, you know, if you work for THON or if you're on, uh, you know, uh, in your sorority, you have a leadership position. Um, anytime I see THON on someone's resume, I think, okay, they worked for, you know, a legit business because that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, and I, I, a lot of that experience is really, really good experience because it talks, it's managing projects, it's working with the team. These are all skills that we're looking for. You do need to demonstrate, you know, the creativity and the work, um, you know, it, it, because it'll fit with that job role. But I, I look for, you know, that kind of um, maturity and experience of being in, a, in, a, in a, almost a real work situation while you're in school. I have two stories actually on this one. Um, one is the most recent one. A Bellisario graduate reached out to me two weeks ago um, saying he wanted to apply for the PAGE program or come work at NBC. Had no national internships, but had worked um, on campus. Honestly, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember where, but three different internships on campus between PSU TV and, and the radio station, et cetera. Um, on top of that, had to work for the IFC, the Fraternity Council, doing communications work. So really sizable resume, just hadn't had really any national experience. We talked things through, you know, he saw where his passions lied, had, you know, a great GPA, et cetera. I wrote a note to the PAGE program um, at NBCU the day after applications closed, just saying I'd had a talk with him. We had recently met, you know, there's nothing there that was national, but I can vouch that everything on that resume was just as you know helpful as anything he would have done had he come to NBC or CBS or anywhere in a summer internship. He's 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 fully on to like the last round now of the Page program after something like that. And like again, he reached out to me with a long note explaining himself and like why and how he made the most of what he was able to get on campus. And I you know took that and. I, I was like, I can vouch. I don't, I met him pretty recently, but I can vouch for what he's, he's done. Um, second is a friend of mine who I've worked with. I was on a team with at NBCU, um, didn't go to Penn State, but had no internship experience in media. Didn't even really think he wanted to work in media, but was looking for jobs back at home. Um, he's from outside the city. He did have experience. So working on campus, um, assisting, um, assistant deans at his college and at other colleges on his college campus and doing their calendars, answering their phones, helping them with all different types of tasks. He applied for an executive assistant role at NBCU, which I think sometimes people turn away from at big companies, mm -hmm. thinking that the assistant role is a lifetime commitment at the assistant role. And in fact, a lot of companies and a lot of executives are looking for someone to do two years learn the role and they wanna promote that person within their team. Um, and that's exactly, this, this person came in to interview and immediately they fell in love with him. They didn't care, he had no background experience in media or television um, or public relations, but that he just was super sweet and had a really good pedigree in being an assistant. And now he's working on our corporate social responsibility team, doing something he's really passionate about. And again, no internships whatsoever. Great. Um, I just want to close it off before, you know, we end here. Is there, what's the biggest piece of advice you can give to students? Um, I, 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 I know I've said it, but um, really uh, demonstrate your work, uh, demonstrate that creativity and um, 
and stand out. Um, you know, be be ready. Um, uh, and I think, like you're doing right now, is leverage your network. Um, you hear it over and over and over and over uh, about the Penn State network and the power of it. But really do that and um, and look at me. I'm you know I'm 30 years out from graduation and and still connected and still part of the family and and still you know making connections through this network. That's that's simply amazing. So so really use it to your advantage. Yeah, I would say on the networking piece, I think it's, it, it really is so important, but I think find ways to personalize everything. You know, I, mm -hmm. I owe everything I have since the college, both, both my internships were because an alumni of the school who worked in television happened to have been my sister's soccer coach. And so I talked to him, you know, all of the time being like, this is what I'm doing on campus. I'm really trying, but I really want this national internship at, it was at NBC first, then at Showtime where he worked. And I just kept that relationship up, but I, I needed to show him that I had the pedigree to get to that point. I think, and again, I had a personal connection to him, so he felt compelled to help me. I think the more that you can look for those connections that are from your hometown, from your high school, from your you know sorority, from you know any club you participated in, you know, people that have, you know, a similar, did similar things as you, they kind of feel like they know you in some way, even if they don't, um, that, you know, that goes back to that story. I just kind of told about like this person really reached out and I felt like I saw so much in the background that I had in this person. And that made me really want to help them out. I, obviously I want to help everyone out, but there's only so many emails and only so many favors I can pull at any time. Um, so I think the, per, the personal connections, I think the other thing too is like, getting these internships and doing kind of the on-campus stuff before you get the bigger internships does require a good amount of time commitment. I think, um, you know, I worked for Procter & Gamble every semester on campus and they would send me like thousands of items and I had to track where they all went. I had to give them out. I had to plan events. I had to create social media posts promoting Procter & Gamble at Penn State. Um, and it took a lot of time and like I missed things that I, you know, obviously still had the best time ever, but I, I did miss things. And so, but I'm happy I did it because it, it bolts my resume up when I needed it to. And, and same with other involvements I had with, you know, Penn State homecoming, et cetera. Um, you know, it takes, it takes an investment now that'll pay off later, but um, it's worth it. But it, 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 you know, you do have to put the time in a little bit. And I think same goes to researching ultimately jobs. I think there's a ton out there, um, but it, it, it takes kind of a reading industry news and especially in the communications field, there's not just marketing jobs, there's like 19 different types of marketing jobs that there are there. And so really getting to know what you wanna do and what internship you want that when you're having that alumni conversation and you, you're not gonna just say to them, well, I wanna work in marketing. Um, you might say to them, I wanna be a brand marketer. I wanna work in creative, you know, marketing, I want to work in, in integrated marketing. I want to do, you know, product placement. Um, that was something that that alumni that I was working with, like he pushed me to be like, well, I'm not except, you know, we're not talking just marketing. Like I need to know what, where you, what you want to do. And that required me reading, you know, variety and deadline Hollywood and all the trade magazines and understanding like who the players were and what I ultimately aspired to be someday. Um, so those three things. Thank you. And I think, you know, just going to add on that I feel like Penn Staters love Penn State alumni love to connect with Penn State students so you know even if you're on LinkedIn and you're looking at an internship and you're looking at the company if you find a Penn Stater that works there you know don't hesitate to reach out to them send them a message on LinkedIn it never hurts to connect that way introduce yourself and just kind of your network so true uh, but thank you thanks again Bernadette and Patrick for joining us this evening um, I just want to remind everyone that this conversation is recorded, so it will be live on the Belisario website after this. And in addition, the next series is about digital media and marketing, and that will be taking place in two weeks on February 16th at 6 p.m. So thanks again, everyone, and stay safe and healthy. Thanks for having us.